All right, so I'm back. Podcast, okay? <laughs> this is podcast number two. I had such an amazing time podcasting just last week. I had my best friend, Pastor Chris Hill, and he was here, and we talked about friendship, really, on the podcast. And so I had such a, well, really, the plan was my, my assistant, everyone is saying, okay, PA, if you could podcast twice a month, that's amazing. But I had such a blast last week <laughs> that I'm like, podcast, podcast. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it again this week. And they're like, okay. And so here we are, podcast number two. Are you just looking for people to podcast with? I, well, Any, exactly, off the street guys exactly, like me? Exactly. <laughs> so then I'm just like, oh, my God, I'll have Mike Lee podcast uh, with me. He can't have anything to do. <laughs> that's, what's he doing? He's, he's chilling. So. Here we are on the podcast, and last night in our Wednesday night service, God, blast. you know, we had such a great time kind of talking about healing division, and in light of all of the things that are happening yeah. in our country right now with Charlottesville and, and, and the president's response to it, and we just really had a great time, and my original idea was for us to podcast about it today. Yeah. That was what I was originally thinking right. that we would do, and then I just said, oh man, let me try to get you to be on stage with me. Uh, and and my I don't know about you, but my the response I've gotten from Wednesday night has just yeah, been it's been cool. It's been really really cool. cool. And I think that the the biggest thing of it hasn't even been because what I want to hear is oh the wisdom that you guys gave <laughs> was so <laughs> enlightening and revelatory. Yeah, I know one guy's the wrong guy. <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> and it's not you. <laughs> no, exactly. Whereas the the where I I think I think the thing that I've heard the most is just kind of. Um, seeing you guys on stage together, um, and and also, uh, it's it's the kind of thing you can't fake. Yeah, you know that if you're comfortable uh, talking about these kinds of things, and if you're if you're if you're gonna be a white guy and in, in a, in I'm a gonna room, be a white guy. You're I gonna don't be really a have white much guy. choice there. <laughs> right? and, I just and, went and, to Hawaii and I tried to change that. I'm, tried I'm to still stand a white up. guy. If you're gonna be a white guy, you're gonna be in this room and you're gonna be on a stage. In, in front of a bunch of African Americans. It's the kind of thing you can't fake yeah. and vice versa. You know, and I think that uh, that was really a big, big part of what happened last night um, was just kind of, and so I wanted to kind of somehow get some of that vibe going on the podcast today. Let's and do it. so here we go, I'm here with Mike Lee and you know, we're talking, talking relations. We're talking, you know, uh, the racial tension and, and st stuff that's going on in the country. And before we started the podcast, we were kind of talking about the fact that it's not necessarily, sometimes we can overly focus on the division. I remember when I was in school, they talked about the fact that the enemy's job is to divide us. Oh yeah. And to exacerbate or overly emphasize our differences to try to divide us. Right. Because when we're united, we just have so much power. Yeah. And so, you know, I think we can focus a lot on the differences that we may have racially, um, and I like to say culturally because we're all the human race, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. Um, but I think that a part of even what's happened and what we're dealing with is 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 the difference generationally. And I thought that's another reason yeah. why we make a good kind of team yeah. in talking about this, because you're a boomer and I'm an Xer. And so some of it is just, it's a generational difference yeah, as is. well. You know, yeah. And some of what, even the disappointment in the president or it's almost like you have his aides and the people that are that are, you know, in it, trying to advise him yeah. on the statement he should make. Yeah. And so it's like Saturday he kind of makes a statement, and then it's kind of like a little bit of his generational perspective comes through. Yeah. And then it's like Monday he's back to kind of clean it up, but then the next day it's almost like his generational perspective came yeah. through again. Yeah. And so I think that that's something that's It's interesting. an interesting phenomenon with, yeah. with Trump because he doesn't need a job. Right. right. And, and most politicians that get elected, it's like, how do I stay elected? You yeah. Know? yeah. And with him, it's like you, you actually get to see what he's really thinking because he's not parsing every word to make sure he gets reelected. Right. And, right. and the true colors are coming out. Right. I mean, right. the reality of it. But, you know, and it's I, interesting. It's it's a it's always that to me, it's that that fine line, it, it, uh, because Paul certainly tells us that, you know, 
God puts in authority over us, which is hard for us to swallow. So yeah. The person who's in authority over us and how we're to be subjected to that authority. And I always remind our congregation that Nero, who was burning Christians at the stake, yeah. was over Paul at that time. Yet Paul's writing this like, hey, you know, that's, that's who God allowed to be there. But I remember the day after staff meeting, we got a couple hundred staff at Hope, and, and you know, it was mixed emotions after, mm-hmm. after the election. I mean, it was all over the place. And the one thing you talk about generational, uh, I said, you know, I've been, I've been through a lot of elections. Mm-hmm. And I've been on the winning side, some. I've been on the losing side, if you want to look at it that way, some. But the reality is, in four years or eight years, we're still here. Right. And God still has a plan. Right. And, you know, in my experience, nobody's screwed it up too much and nobody's really accomplished that much. Yep. And God, even though he, he puts them there, you know, man makes his plans, God directs his step. And yep. I think sometimes as Christians, we just have to take that deep breath and say, yeah, I, I disagree, I agree, whatever the position is. But yet at the end of the day, God knows exactly what's going on, and he has a purpose. And I, I tell our congregation, I say, hey, if the world's coming to an end and God is using people to get us there, we get a front row seat. I mean, how right. cool is it as a Christian to be the one that God entrusts you to watch it all unravel and fall apart? Because, right. you know, hey, right. we win. In the right. end, we win. Right. So. I say something very similar because I kind of feel like I think in America, we, especially the Christian side of us, you know, we, we want a Christian leader. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't I think we don't like to necessarily look at the parts of the Bible, the times in the Bible yeah. when the leader wasn't necessarily a Christian or wasn't necessarily in in a relationship with God. You know, whether we're talking about Joseph and Pharaoh, whether we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, mm-hmm. just because the leader isn't, quote unquote, godly doesn't mean that God can't speak to him. Right. And it doesn't mean that the 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 body of Christ's role sometimes is is to interpret and to administrate versus just to rule. Yeah. And I know we love to say, oh, Joseph's ruling the country, but the thing that got him there was his ability to interpret yeah. another's dream and then to say, and here's the plan on how to live it out. Absolutely. And I think that's what we got into, we got into last night was we kind of got into the fact that Jesus is the answer or Christianity is the yeah. answer, love is the answer on how to do it. We can go back and forth forever on the what's, but the how of it, yeah. it really is kind of our role, you know, Well, in yeah, the body. I mean, just, just the gospels. I mean, yeah. most of the mess we have, not just in our country and the world, it's because we yielded as followers of Jesus Christ, our influence. Mm-hmm. And then we expect the government to step in and to carry out a biblical agenda. And that was never it. You know, Jesus made it very clear. You are the light right. of the world. Right. You know? right. You're the one that's going to be the light on that hill. But what happens is we kind of step back, we kind of vacate uh, the influence that God has given us, and we then we want to vote someone in that's going to have God's agenda. And God's like, no, no, I told you to take care of the poor. I told you to visit those who are in prison. I told you mm-hmm. to take care of the widow. That's not the government's job. But now we want the government to do that. And I think the only way it's going to change is if, once again, the church of Jesus Christ becomes the light of the world. And see, the reason why we don't really like to think about it is because as the people of God, I don't think we ever really like to focus too much on how we lost the power. It's something I say on a regular basis that the enemy never comes into power because they're strong. They come into power because there's uh, there's idolatry Mm -hmm. in the church. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can rant and rail at the Babylonians all you want, but the reason why Nebuchadnezzar and those guys are coming in here is because the idolatry has reached a place where the Lord is just like, okay, y'all are going to Babylon. And there are times that God used the bad guys. That's right. To bring the lesson. That's you right. Know? And That's it's right. like, even as we read that sometimes, especially in the Old Testament, it's, it's hard for us to fathom that God says, yeah, I'm going to have you guys do yep. some work for me because I got to get Israel's attention. Yep. And, and, so. and, it's, and it's like Jeremiah is kind of coming in and he has to prophesy the truth. All the other prophets are like, no, it's God, God is going to turn this thing around. Yeah. And Jeremiah has to say, okay, can I just tell you what the Lord is actually saying? Yeah. He's saying, pack your stuff, you're going to Babylon. You know, and I think that, but it, once again, it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a Jeremiah. There isn't going to be a Nehemiah that rebuilds the right. walls. There's not going to be Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those, those kinds, of, it's not like 
the body loses its power. Just yeah. because it's not popular doesn't mean it's not powerful. Yeah. And uh, but I think you're right. You know, I think that you know that we have to we have to think about the love of Christ. You well, know? and it's like you know the, the the worship last night was just just so right on for where we are. But to remember that he's a good, good father. Yeah. You know, he's perfect in all of his ways, that he has a plan. I mean, even if you go back again to the Old Testament, yeah, Israel messed up. They screwed up, you know, but God used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Cyrus. He used, he used Darius. Remember when he brought Ezra in and said, oh, by the way, all the gold we took from the temple, we still have it stored over here. Well, and it well. was Ezra's job to get it all back to the temple. But even behind the scenes, we can't lose hope and faith that regardless of what we see on the surface, God's got a plan. I mean, all we can really do is get up every day and we can't pray for our leaders. We certainly need to do that. But yet, you know, be faithful. Yeah. What does God call me to be faithful to right now? Yeah. And sometimes as, as dark as it gets, it's like the only hope we have is that and I know it sounds over spiritualized, but either you believe God's in control right. or you don't believe God's in control. Yeah. And I love it when it tells us in James five, I've seen this so many times, I'm sure you have too, is that, you know, pray for the sick, anoint him with oil. I gotta be honest with you, Andy, a lot of people I pray for, I bury. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But this yeah. is what happens. Often when someone goes through that process, there's this emotional and spiritual healing that takes place where people walk out thinking, Wow, even if God's plan isn't to heal me. I, mean, I can deal with this because yeah. it's God's plan. And sometimes we just have to get to that place where we realize, you know, I, I can't find, I always tell people, I can't find America an end time prophecy. So either right. we're right. no longer around or we're just, we're not a player, right? Right. S somebody's going to be here. And if you look at the cycle of great civilizations, they last about 300 years and typically go, they go from bondage and slavery to freedom to all, you know, goes all the way around back to basically then there's apathy. Yeah. You know, and then it leads back into bondage again. And I don't yeah. know. You just if you look at those things, you think just eat dessert first because you just don't know. But right. God has <laughs> God has a plan. But getting back to the topic of racism and, you know, I, I nobody's born a racist. Right. Right. And the, the place that healing starts, you know, and this renewing of the mind that Paul talks about in Romans, it's in our families. It's yeah. in our homes. I, you know, I was so pleased. I grew up in Durham. Um, and my parents were your typical parents that grew up in the South. We lived on one side of the railroad tracks on Austin Avenue. On the other side of the railroad tracks is where the African-American community was. And it was, it was divided that way. And then I went to Hillside High School and, and I was the min minority there. And, and, but, but it's interesting, there, there was that tension and you would hear things because it was the South. It was the South in the 60s. But then when I married Laura, my wife, we moved to California. It's a whole different issue. But you know what? There's racism in California, too, yeah. all over the place. Wherever you go, there's going to be racism. But one of the things that uh, I'll never forget, as a parent, made my heart so happy. My son was at school, and he came home after school, and he wanted to tell me a story about one of his friends in his class. And he was trying to describe him to me, and the only way he could describe him was like, Dad, he's, you know him. He's the boy with the brown skin. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, we've done we've done something right yeah he didn't label him he was just the boy with the brown skin you know him and so i know that even as parents we've got we've got to watch what we say and how we communicate and how we react to what's going on to our kids because man they listen yeah but you know they're not born racist yeah. somebody's teaching them how to be a racist yeah and i think that we have to keep in mind that there's a difference between racism and something that is racial. Yep. Sometimes yeah. things are racially motivated. Yeah. Racism is kind of, okay, I'm prejudging you based on your race right. or based on who you are. And that can lead to racial tension. Right. Because uh, I think sometimes that a part of the other mistake that we can make is we just want everybody to be exactly the same. Yeah. And the, there's a reason why the Lord made us all different. There's a reason why we're all these different cultures. And when we, when we come together, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm but it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to be exactly like you or you have to be exactly like me. I think that one of the things that I, that the insights that you're sharing, I, I hope everyone that's watching or listening is getting a piece of it, is that I think that when you're a believer, when you're a Christian, you, and you, you were saying it when you were talking about praying for someone to be healed, God knows I've, I've been there, that, that there's kind of this, this, this clash of wills or this clash of desires with God in that a part of my 
a part of the role of faith is a to believe God can change a situation and then another part of it is he can empower me to deal with the things that maybe I can't necessarily change mm -hmm. so that okay because what, a part of what we got into last night was that okay here we are we're both these guys and we both have had you've had experiences you know with African Americans that has just made you be someone and taught your kids to be like yeah we're we're all the same and the same is true with me I mean I, I you know I grew up in Boston I went to predominantly white schools um, you know I was trained in the classics Ovid and all of it and I and uh, most of my best friends coming up in high school even in the racial tension you know there was a couple I said it last night there was a couple in my in my dad's church that were basically like an aunt and uncle to me John and Joan Campitelli they were like I mean I I stayed at their house at times and you know they they babysat us and fed me spaghetti and you know really loved me and so I think that 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 empowered me to be this person um, as a result of the experiences that I had, the love relationships that I had. But even with that being said, with both of us having those experiences and being where we are, it's not like you have this amazingly racially divided church or I have this amazingly mm -hmm. racially, I don't say mean divided, I mean reconciled. Right. It's not like you've got some 50-50 church right. and I've got some 50-50 church. And so I think that a part of what we're, we're kind of trying to do, even in our coming together, is to believe God for the things that that he can change and and at the same time to also say all right Lord these are some things that maybe they haven't changed yet I think that that's a part of what we have to offer as hope uh, when we talk about racial division because we can get we can almost become discouraged in the fact that it hasn't changed yet like that's a lot of what I'm hearing like I can't believe that we're still dealing right. with something in 2017 yep that we were dealing with in 1967. I mean, I kind of said that when, you know, with kind of the police and I have I have 17 year old boys. Yeah. So when my boys get in the car and drive off with their friends, I'm not necessarily afraid of them getting in to, into some house party and getting, that's not what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that, and my boys are just good athletes, students, smart boys, but I'm afraid they're gonna be mistaken. And so I, I had to have a conversation with them in 2016 that my dad had to have with me in 1986. And that bothered me. So I think sometimes we're bothered. It's almost kind of like, we're still here. You hear yeah. that in America, yeah. like, oh my God, yeah. we're still here. Are yeah. we really, is this 2017? And are we still dealing with issues that they were dealing with in 67, 77, 87? Are we gonna make this progress? And I think a part of our job is to say, is to have faith and believe, yes, kingdom can change it, God can change it, prayer can change it. At the same time, yep. a part of our job is to say, okay, yep. but as it, okay, so let's say it doesn't change, or let's say that this is our lot for a little bit more of a period of time. Okay, but then what? Yep. How do we carry ourselves? What is our role as believers, even when things don't go necessarily the way that we want them to go? I know? think part of it, when Paul talks about um, in, in Romans 12 about the renewing of the mind is that there's a lot of lies we just believe. Mm -hmm. And until we acknowledge that they're lies and we renew our mind, especially with scripture, like it's just always going to be this way. Are they just different than us? Or I just don't understand them. Those are just lies. They're, yeah. And they're from the enemy. And Paul talks about you got to take every thought captive. But we've got to begin with renewing our minds. And I don't even know how to do that until people at least start having conversations mm -hmm. and talking. I mean, we can sit up here all we want to. We can, we're going to be different. Yeah. You know, when I come to your church, I watch your congregation worship. I'm like, why can't my congregation <laughs> worship? African-Americans, you're expressive. I mean, yeah. it, you, it one end to the other. I was one time uh, talking with a guy and he said, he says, Mike, the African-American community is different. He says, if I'm right down the street and I see my friend in a fight, I'm not going to hey, go over and I'm like, I'm going to hop in and get in that fight with him. And I might be telling him, you better have a good reason for having a fight. Right, right, right. But, but he says, we have that kind of community together. And, uh, you know, I used to say, well, we just worship differently. And it's just a preference where people go to church. But it, it's deeper than that. Yeah. It's a lot, lot deeper than that. Yeah. But the reality is we're going to be different. Our backgrounds are different. Our heritage are different. Our, our, our personalities are different. But when we can understand the beauty 
of the body of Christ. Yeah. And so, you know, when we come here and worship with you guys or we have a combined worship night, we go back to our church and learn from you guys and we are actually a better congregation. Yeah. And I hope that when you guys come over and worship with us, they might be something that you're like, man, we can, but if we could just learn from each other and quit being threatened by each other and immediately the walls go, it's the weirdest thing in the world to me, but yeah. it's, it's in so many areas of life. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. It's just I mean, it can happen areas. along race. It can also happen along even gender. And I know gender. we're not really here to talk about gender, but sometimes we have a we have a tendency to kind of focus on things that women can do that man that men have a hard time doing, mm -hmm. and we use that in a critical way yeah. to say, "Well, you guys need to be more sensitive," and maybe we do, but but uh, that's a part of the reason why we 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 need each other. That's right. I need you because you're more sensitive, yeah. or I need you because you listen more, and you need me because. Of whatever, whatever, yeah. whatever guys are supposed to bring to the table right. at this point, which we can barely even say what we bring because the minute we say <laughs> it, it's like, oh my God, are you saying that women can't do that? Yeah, sure. I'm not saying women can't be strong. Mm. Yeah, women can be strong. But then I think that once again, it's the job of the enemy to kind of divide us yep. and yep. then to use our differences to separate us from one another instead of our ability to say, okay, we're on a team together and I need you. You know, I played basketball, you know, in high school, played some in college, and I was never just Mr. Everything. You know, I basically was a shooter. And, and so I was the kind of player where without other people around me, I just wasn't very good. You know, my brother was a point guard, and so I got to a point where if I wasn't playing with him, because he's dribbling and penetrating and kicking to me. Right. The reason why I'm scoring, there were games where I led our team in scoring, but it wasn't because of it was because of me, but it wasn't because of me. Right. And so it was I I really really learned, you know, how important team is and how much the team aspect of it matters and how the worst thing that can ever happen to your team is for you to be divided. Absolutely. And I think that that's true in the body, it's true with couples, you know, you know, I, I was talking to a guy the other day and I was saying, and he was kind of almost complaining a little bit about this strength that his wife had that he just doesn't have. And I was like, dude, that's really great. I mean, if you have found somebody <laughs> that is strong in an area where you're weak, then you really, you're on to something, yeah. you know, because that's what teams are about, yep. you know. And I think that we have to find out, out how to do that better in the body. You know, I, really I, I tell people all the time, I'm like a kept man. I mean, right. I married the smartest woman in the world. She handles her finances. She, she bought one of my houses, our houses while I was in Africa. I didn't even see it till we got home. Right. She, does, she decorates it. She does everything. And I trust her 100% because I know she's better at it right. than I am. And yeah. I think it's the same thing in our relationship. For, for example, Andy, when I, when I worship with you guys, the, you have a connection with the Holy Spirit that as a congregation we don't have. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm not sure why, but I, you sense the power at work. You sense the living out of that relationship. And I remember one time walking away from you guys and uh, I think it was the night we had dinner. We had dinner at Ray's with mm -hmm. uh, Ron from over Kings Park and all. I got in the car afterwards and, and I talked, I, I, I called Gary Vett, Gary was there, and I said, I don't know what they got, but I want some of it. <laughs> and that's just one example of how you have made me better. You make me more effective. Uh, you make me more complete. You complete me. <laughs> you complete me, <laughs> right? But, but the reality is right. there is so much we can learn. But see, we get over here in our little silo, yeah. and we think, well, we figured it out. Look at the size of my church. Right. But the reality is, well, we figured out how to reach people who are just like us right. and think just like us. But we yeah. haven't figured out how to reach people who have questions that we can't answer. Right. right. So it's true, and very much like a marriage, if we could get to the point where we realize we got so much. Like last, last night when I was here, one of your facility guys, and you'll know me immediately, but he, he went to show me the gym and all, and he was telling me his story about getting stabbed and then them finding out that he had melanoma mm -hmm. and they gave him, what, three months to live, and here he is five years later, and I'm like, that's a guy I want to video or bring into my church because people need to hear his story. There's so much 
if we could just get outside of ourselves. I'm glad we are. Yeah. I mean, I believe God's doing something unique yeah. in our congregations, but I don't want to limit it yeah. to our congregations. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think that, it, once again, it's kind of the, the tenor of what we've been kind of saying today is that if the differences divide us, then we're not as strong. Yeah. Because, you know, and I think that that happens, it can happen racially, it can happen generationally, it can happen just between friends. Yeah. You know, last week's podcast, me and Chris Hill are kind of talking about friendship and, and our, we, we're, we're in, we were in very different worlds for a while. Because I was pastoring this church, which to me, pastoring is, is like farming. And he was this worldwide evangelist, which to me is like hunting. Yeah. And so, I, we, we, now it's very easy to become envious or covetous of what the other person is doing if you don't really care about each other. Yeah. You know, so he could very easily be looking at me and thinking, oh my God, you have this big church or whatever, you're experiencing success in this way. And I could just as easily look at him and say, yeah, but you just preached at Planet Shakers Conference. What about me? Yeah. And so <laughs> I think that, you know, I, I think that we have to, we have to keep the enemy from dividing us. Mm -hmm. And it was something that we were always able to do in our friendship because we really cared about each other to, to celebrate each other's successes. You know, and it's this thing, when I came over to Hope Community, because I mean, as, as beautiful as our facilities are, World Overcomers, we lease this space. You know, we've got, we've got five years left on this lease. And so we are right now kind of planning, okay, what is our next step? How are we gonna build? How are we gonna, what are we gonna do? And so when I came to Hope Community, I was just like, it's almost like, yes, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, this is what I'm talking about getting people to be able to come together and agree together around a commitment. And, and so, like you're saying, I mean, you're looking at us and thinking, oh, this is amazing. I'm looking at you guys and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, the, because although your, your congregation didn't necessarily scream crazy, there was a reverence, <laughs> that was, there was a reverence that was there. And I felt it, I felt like, no, these people, they revere God. Well, they, they keep have asking me when you're coming God. back. So they <laughs> they have a reverence for God, you know, and I think that that's, I think that's important. And so I think that um, that's all a part of what we're talking about today, about, you know, us believing that, uh, that our connection, and our relationship is the key to it in the and future. I, and I think that, and I'm really glad that God laid that on your heart yesterday, because I think one of the keys is Typically, when something's going on like it's going on in culture right now, what happened at Charlottesville, there's a tendency to separate and hunker down and kind of think through and process. And I think what your attempt was last night, no, 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 let's bring it together. Yeah. Let's bring it together. And I, I think that even outside of ourselves, we have to be looking for those other con congregations. And not just, it's not just African American, it's, it's Hispanic, it's all over yeah. the place. We got to look at this congregation as, and run to them yeah. and come together because I believe there's a calming effect to that to yeah. realize yeah. first of all this isn't all white people right 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 are like this right, right? in fact right. Uh, i was uh laura my wife was telling me that she saw that our college pastor had posted that uh if white supremacists go to heaven they're gonna have a tough time because there's gonna be every nation in tongue i'm <laughs> yeah. not sure how i'm right. not sure they're, how they're gonna deal with that right, right but right. the reality is instead of separating that's when we have to run together yeah and yeah. i mean we we got we got people in our community that, that aren't even in the body of Christ. Right. Boy, right. there's some basic healing that needs to take place. Yeah. Maybe. And I believe again that Christ has called us as His followers to be the light, yeah. and to and to and to offer that olive branch and say, yeah. man, can't can't we just get along? I'm right. Be gracious. Right. And I think the things that have happened over the past week, yeah, stuff that's happened in Charlottesville, things that are happening in the country, the president's response to it, et cetera. If nothing else. It is a wake up call. And sometimes I don't, I think we don't necessarily yeah. always like wake up calls. It's almost like, I don't want to go to the doctor cause they're going to find something wrong. I mean, thank you. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, if I there's something wrong, the sooner we catch it, the better off we're all going to be. Yep. And so we can't, we can be angry about what caused us to realize that we need to do better. We can be mad about it or we can say, yeah, okay. It's a wake up call for mm -hmm. us. And we have to realize we still have a ways to go yeah. in this nation. And uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't people who do love each other. It doesn't mean that we're not ever going to come together. Um, but there's hope and yeah. there's faith. And a part of faith is the substance of things that we hope for. Yeah. And we hope for a better America and we hope for a better world for our children. 
and uh, for our grandchildren. You know, yeah. I have a granddaughter. My my no daughter. Way. Yeah, my daughter's about that. My my oldest daughter's about to have another kid, and so you know she's pregnant and about to be in her third trimester. And so I have, I have hope for that that their yeah. world will be a better world than right. than our world. That when we're in heaven, looking down, you know, we'll see them reach and accomplish, you know. Um, but that hate is going to be there because the enemy is, the wrestle is against the enemy ultimately. Yeah. And, uh, and he's going to try to cause us to be divided. With well, this other. is my commitment to you because I believe one of, the, one of the legitimate complaints about the church of Jesus Christ is lots, lots of times we're the last one to the party. Yeah. We yeah. get in Bob too late and we ought to be taking the lead. Right. And I believe, I believe that God has brought us together, not by accident, but for a reason. And not just us, but I think there's actually a, a movement of the spirit to our whole community saying, you know, this idea of isolation, this idea of we're the only ones who have it right, it's us four and no more. I really believe those walls are breaking down. Yeah. And I'm not sure this would have happened five years ago. Yeah, I agree. But I believe that God is moving in a new and in a fresh way. I'm yeah. glad I get to be a part of it with you. And I think, you know, yeah. I think the things that's interesting too that I think we can kind of overlook is that you know one of the guys on staff with me here is a white guy who James Bennett who's been with me for almost 20 years, and he was saying to me it's interesting that you know the the first girl that the the girl that really died the girl that, that mm -hmm. is a is a white girl, mm -hmm. and so because there were it's there were white and black it wasn't like it turned mm -hmm. into this race mm -hmm. war no whereas. African Americans on one side and white people on the other side. No, yeah. there were white people that were there that were protesting just as, as vociferously. I mean, yeah. it was just as, and so I, I feel like it, that we have to look at that mm -hmm. as well and say, yeah, but there was a time when it was predominantly black people marching through the street saying we shall overcome. Yeah. Whereas in, even in that protest, the, the 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 side that was protesting against you know anti-semitism and and white supremacy the group that was protesting against that group was very diverse yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so i think that that's also a sign to us i have to take that every african-american has to take that as a sign that hey the church even the country recognizes this is not healthy yeah and uh and and hate is not a good thing for us it's something we have to get past so all right so that was our podcast today. Trust everybody uh, was was edified or whatever, empowered or glorified or not glorified, but but hopefully at least stayed away. <laughs> hopefully at least <laughs> paid attention to us, and uh, we had a great time. Love Mike, you, man, appreciate it, man. Appreciate you. Too. Um, so thanks so much for being on with us today, Mike Lee, Hope Community Church, and uh, we had a good time. And the best is yet to come. See you at lunch next week. Yeah. <laughs> Bless you, man.